Um, hi, everybody. Good evening, Kathy. Um, uh, hi, Cheyenne. Well, thanks for coming um, at all. Cheyenne's leaving a link to Lee Camp um, um, on the Bolivian coup. I'm sure Lee has some good things to say because he probably gets the good things from the same source as I do. <laughs> and uh, Liz says, uh, watch later. And she has a Naomi Wolf um, a video for us. Um, I enjoy watching those very frequently. They're certainly always good for thought. Hi, Greg. Nice to see you. And Steve Wolfbrand is here, too. Hi, Steve. Oh, thank you all for sharing. My God, you produced a lot of shares in a very short time. Thanks a lot. Please keep on sharing, liking, and subscribing. Well, what I wanted to do today was to look beyond our current uh, struggles and look a little bit towards our future struggles and dream a little bit. In fact, I might have called this um, the dream time, colon, uh, the leisure agenda and moves towards uh, socialism. So, um, but bear with me while I discuss some, uh, some pretty good articles. And then we'll talk about them. Okay. Oops. I see some, uh, see some new comments here. And Lana says, woohoo for sharing. <laughs> Thank you, Lana. And Teresa Sanders has joined too. Hi, Teresa. Nice to see you. Greg can't share at all because He's in FB jail, I think, until September 9th, <laughs> which is a long time. So anyway, let's look in on the shares. Have I opened up any yet? Let me see. No, I haven't. But I will. Okay, I think I'm ready to go now. I'll move to uh, this view where I share the page with you, except I'm not sharing the page yet, sorry. <laughs> so, this is an article from Jacobin. And it's by Megan Day, and the title is, We Now Have a Democratic Socialist. Uh, leisure agenda, quote unquote. I'll get the extraneous matter out, and here we go through the article. Uh, she makes the point that our society entertained uh, the notion that our technological progress would automatically result in more leisure time for all. And there were many who predicted this, uh, who predicted this, including Keynes in the 1930s and 1940s. And they thought that intending to their um, economic interests, the capitalist class might actually hasten the arrival of the age of leisure, okay, and of abundance for all. And there were a number of books written in the post-war period also, in the post-war period, 
that envisioned abundance for all and the age of cave leisure and much um, but shorter work weeks. Not because of the threat of okay, automation, but just because of the general idea that the productivity of the economy was going to increase to such a degree that uh, it would be possible for people to work uh, far less than the 40 hour per week. And it was expected that we might go down to a 30 hour week or even a 25 hour week and there would be much more time for uh, for uh, 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 for leisure, uh, for family life, for doing creative things, and God forbid, even for participating in politics. But, says um, uh, Megan Day, nearly a century later, Keynes's dream remains unfulfilled. Workers may be more productive, generating high profits for capitalists, but work time itself has not been significantly reduced. In the United States, worker productivity has more than doubled since 1973, while real wages have stagnated. Of course, we all know this already because we've been feeling the stagnations in our own lives. And corporate profits have um, um, actually ballooned, and though average work hours have declined slightly, Americans still work far more than their European counterparts. Keynes believed in the long run that um, he believed in the, um, in the long run okay that mankind is solving okay its economic uh, problem Ex excuse me just a second please okay I will be right back Okay, sorry. I thought you might be hearing, okay, an echo, and I thought I should do something about it. So, just give me another second, and let me make sure. Oh, there are no echoes. Steve says, I was raped in FB jail by Mayo Pete. <laughs> God. Cheyenne said, the food in FB jail is pretty bad. Steve says, I'm <laughs> loose for the moment. Well, you've been having a lot of fun here, I see, and I've been missing it all. Hey, Russ. <laughs> okay. So I'll get back to what I was doing. If there are any echoes, please uh, let me know. I'll check in from time to time and find out. Guess I got to go back to where I was. Here we go. Okay, so where was I? Uh, decades before him, Karl Marx, uh, that is um, decades before Keynes, Karl Marx uh, suspected otherwise, warning that the only way workers would get more time for themselves, time which amounts to a loss in potential profits for employers is by fighting for it. Quote, uh, the determination of what is a working day, unquote, Marx wrote, quote again, presents itself as the result of a struggle, a struggle between collective capital, i.e. the class of capitalists, and collective labor, i.e. the working class, um, unquote. Well, that statement actually resonates today. Okay. It does not resonate quite so much back in the 1950s and 1960s, okay, and maybe the 1970s, but increasingly in the 1980s, 1990s, and up to the present, it is echoing more okay, and more. Now, mind you, I think the social sciences have actually resulted in 
increasing difficulty for the definition of uh, the class. Uh, who, like who exactly are the capitalists, how are they defined, and who exactly are uh, the, uh, the working class. And uh, I've never been entirely sure that classes can be measured in any precise way, um, actually myself, but nevertheless, this statement uh, really resonates in terms of what has happened, because uh, generally speaking, labor has been fighting for years and years and years here um, um, in this country and making no progress in shortening the working day or fighting for more free time. Almost no progress okay, at all. Uh, the battle for the eight-hour day, uh, says the author, was along a driving force for working class movements in the U.S., the country's first uh, 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 national uh, labor federation, uh, raised the demand in 1866, and it wasn't fully realized in the United States until 1940. The decades between saw a bitter class struggle over work hours, with some even sacrificing their lives for a, uh, a universal legal limit on how much personal time um, bosses would be able to demand as a condition of employment. And now Megan gets to the present. The struggle for free time continues to hold promise for working class movements, especially in the United States where people work on average 269 more hours or 33 and a half uh, work days per year, about a month and a half more than the wealth of the country would um, predict. History demonstrates that people will fight to take their time back, but in order to effectively uh, activate people in that fight, we need specific demands to rally around. Lucky for us, the People's Policy Project, an organization started uh, actually by Matt, um, but, uh, by, um, by, uh, by uh, um, actually by Matthew Brunig. I think his wife Elizabeth is involved too in some ways. Anyway, the People's Policy Project has come up with a list of ideas. Their report, quote, uh, The Leisure Agenda, unquote, was published last week in concert with the Gravel Institute. Yeah, old Mike, old Michael Gravel as an institute. Many of the ideas detailed by the author of the report, Ryan Cooper, are lifted straight from existing policies in uh, the countries okay, of Europe, and I think a few in Asia, with social, demo um, social democratic political traditions, that is, stronger traditions of class struggle than we have in the United States. The implementation of these ideas will certainly be met with resistance from employers in the United States, but they are completely workable in practice. Quote, uh, um, Our current, rather pathetically backward labor system is in a way a blessing. Uh, Ryan Cooper writes, giving us ample opportunity for, quote again, copy pasting proven models uh, from, uh, from wiser nations, unquote. Now, the Leisure Agenda report begins with a bleak look at the current state of overwork in the United States before serving a buffet of policy options that would give workers more time for uh, whatever they will. 
First Cooper observes there are only 10 federal holidays so far. If we add five more, that's 15 days or three days off work. So that's one proposal. Five more holidays, giving us a full three weeks. But three weeks off is still far less than workers in many other countries get, and besides, workers need to cluster their days off together in order to go on vacation. Cooper recommends a United States Vacation Act that would eventually mandate, after a transition period, a full four hours of paid vacation a year. Um, 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 but currently, um, the U.S. workers a guaranteed no paid vacation by law. That's left up to individual work contracts. And the United States is also one of the only countries that um, 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 doesn't actually mandate paid family leave on a federal level. Cooper recommends a policy of 36 weeks of publicly funded paid uh, leave. If a child is welcomed into a home with one parent, that parent gets the full 36 weeks. If there are two parents, each parent is allotted 18 weeks of paid time off, but can transfer up to 14 weeks to the other parent if they want to. If a parent is not currently working, they would still be paid uh, the, uh, the minimum wage during the first few months of new uh, 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 parenthood. Now, that would be especially important if we had a minimum wage that was a living wage, or rather, a living wage, okay, which then, of course, would be the de facto minimum wage. Okay. Uh, and if a parent is highly paid, and by the way, I should add, not only a okay, minimum wage for the parent, but a further allowance, a stipend for a new child, as they have in many of the nations of Europe. And if a parent is highly paid, then their publicly funded stipend would be commensurate with the national uh, uh, um, average wage. Uh, the U.S. doesn't actually mandate paid sick leave either, but we can change that. Cooper suggests that every employer, every, every employee who has worked for one month should become eligible for a, few ye for a full year of paid uh, sick leave. And by the way, that's already in effect in at least uh, one nation of Europe. The first month would be paid by the employer. If a doctor confirms they're still too sick to work after a month, the federal government would pay their wage on the same scale as the proposed um, um, family leave um, um, policy. And if workers are still sick after a year, they'll be eligible for disability. Day says, right now we have a balkanized and insufficient uh, um, unemployment benefits um, program. Cooper recommends overhauling that and guaranteeing a whole year of publicly paid unemployment set at the national um, um, average uh, wage. Um, uh, also, he recommends that the government provide a job seeker allowance for those who have no employment history and would therefore be ineligible for ordinary uh, um, unemployment, uh, but, uh, uh, but, um, unemployment, uh, but, uh, but, uh, uh, benefits, a model already in place in Finland. Finally, older Americans are staying in the workforce longer because Social Security payments don't cover the cost of living. And this should stop. And Cooper writes, quote, 
We should be aiming for um, old age benefit levels that enable us to bring our elderly employment rates down to the OECD average of elderly employment rates, unquote. Uh, Cooper writes, and by the way, if we could make that happen, then folks of my age uh, would probably not have to ask you to go to their Patreon pages. <laughs> Which, if any of these demands will capture the popular imagination, is uncertain. But democratic socialists and progressive organizations and politicians would do well to advance them. Otherwise, says Day, and I think she's dead right about this, they will remain unthinkable, and no movement around them will emerge. The demand for the eight-hour day didn't spontaneously appear from thin air. It was pushed by a Boston machinist and labor leader named Ira Stewart, and, fa and presented at the founding convention of the National, the National uh, um, Labor Union in 1866, specifically as a way to set the work uh, weary masses into motion behind something concrete. There is great potential here, not only in the struggle for free time, but also in the attainment and exercise of it. As Marx wrote, quote, free time, which is both idle time and time for higher um, activity, has naturally transformed its, uh, uh, its, um, uh, um, transfor transformed its possessor into a different subject, and he then enters into the direct, uh, into the direct, uh, 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 to the direct production process as this different subject. Unquote. The more a person has time to observe and consider the world and to access the accumulated knowledge of society, unquote, the more confidence they become in acting to change it. Of course, not everyone will spend their free time accessing higher knowledge. Some will spend it um, loafing around, and that's fine too. Relaxation is a right as fundamental as freedom. In fact, a person with no time to relax is not someone we can credibly consider free. So, included in freedom is actually relaxation um, as a right, um, idle time. Okay, now the neoliberals, of course, have done all they can to persuade us that we don't have a right to um, idle time, that we have to spend as much of the working week as we possibly can as much of the week as we possibly can, um, um, as, um, as simply working. And that is something that we should not accede to. Now, just a few random comments. First, uh, the article mentions that in the United States, we work six, 269 more hours on the average per year than the wealth of our country would actually predict. But what we have to understand is that there are countries that work less than their wealth would actually predict. Which is the least hardworking country in the world from the standpoint of um, how it's worked? 
Now, many of you would be surprised to know that it's actually Germany. They, uh, as I recall, they work something like 1,350 to 1,380 hours per year, something like that. I'm not sure of, um, um, exactly the figure, but I know for sure it's under 1,400 hours. Okay. Uh, we work somewhere in the high 1700s. We should be access, able to access the exact figure later. I think it will come up in some of the rest of the things that I'm going to show you tonight. I think it's 1769 or um, 1700, okay, and 96 or something like that. But it's in that particular neighborhood. So it, it's roughly 430 hours more than the Germans work on, on, on the average. That's a lot more free time the Germans have. The work week is much shorter okay, in Denmark as well, okay, and in the Nordic countries, um, but generally speaking, not so much in Finland, and not so much in Greece, but in much of the OECD countries, the work week is much lower than uh, in the United States and even lower than the 269 more hours than the average that, uh, that we work. So that is very important to, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, one reason why Americans are so relatively politically uh, inactive compared to other nations, um, um, I think, is people have less time to get involved in politics. There's less time. So this affects our political system. By getting people to work so much, okay, the neoliberals have actually sustained the, uh, the neoliberal way of doing things, which over the years has deprived most of us of more and more um, but potential wealth and actual wealth okay, um, as well. So I wanted to make that clear, but let's look for a minute. Let's take this off. And let's look for a minute at uh, the report this article was based on. I spoke of that. I'm not going to go through it. But it's called uh, The Leisure Agenda. It was written by Ryan Cooper, as I said earlier. Ah, here it is. Okay, so Americans worked a collective 250 bi 50 billion hours in 2017. 1,739 hours. Uh, for uh, uh, every worker. I'm sorry, I thought it was in the high 1700s. It's actually in the middle 1700s, 1739 hours. Uh, so you can see this report is very nicely done and very nice to read. It's very sharp. It has nice uh, um, uh, uh, photos has a nice graphic okay, of where the countries in the OECD are. And you notice Germany, Denmark, um, Norway, the Netherlands, Sweden, Austria, France. Uh, they all work a lot less uh, than, uh, than we do. Uh, Germany is somewhere down here in the 1300s. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, some uh, 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 some other countries go up to fifteen hundred. But we are the worst country on this chart. That's because the chart does not include uh, Greece. Okay, the last time I looked at the hours worked um, in Greece, it was an average of something like 1,800 okay, in 80 hours. I always found it very funny okay, that the Germans... Um, um, during the crisis that Greece has been having since 2000, okay, and 10. Okay, they believed in a myth. Okay, the myth was that uh, the Greeks uh, were lazy, and that's why they were having the financial troubles uh, they were having. Uh, and the Greeks were working 1,880 hours, and the Germans were working closer to 1,350 hours. <laughs> and the Germans thought the Greeks, okay, were lazy. And the Greeks did not seem to know that it was the Germans who only worked a total of 1,350 okay, hours. Now, one of the most important reasons why... Uh, the Greeks were having such problems, okay, and the Germans were not, is that uh, the Germans had an enormous trade surplus with the remainder of the Eurozone. And they were busy collecting money in return for goods from all of the other nations. So the other nations were having budgetary problems. And the crash then proceeded to precipitate hard times, but the Germans kept on running their trade surpluses, basically victimizing all the other countries, okay, especially Greece. So the Germans didn't want to recognize that it was partly their fault uh, that Greece was having these enormous uh, uh, financial troubles. So they projected onto the Greeks the idea that the Greeks uh, were lazy and that it was their fault that they were so poor and were having these kinds okay, of difficulties. And of course, the German trade policies didn't have anything to do with that. Okay. Sound familiar? Anyway, here's a graph of GDP per hour, and the United States, okay, is an outlier. Uh, the GDP per hour, uh, uh, the average hours worked is very high. Uh, and the GDP per hour of labor is actually rather low compared okay, to other nations. That was in 2016. And then the figure that shows uh, that uh, the uh, the U.S. works 269 more hours than the wealth of its economy would actually predict. And you have a very nice graphic here, uh, which looks at uh, all those countries that uh, have... Oh, do best, okay, on hours worked in terms of um, actually having a lesser number of hours worked 
uh, than uh, would be predicted based on uh, the wealth of the country. And you'll notice the highest country there, okay, is Germany. Countries that are doing very well include on uh, uh, this particular measure include uh, some of the Baltic countries and Slovenia and Hungary, okay, the Netherlands, Portugal, Denmark, okay, and the UK. And then we get into some other countries that are still doing fairly well. In other words, they have um, fewer hours than you would expect um, based on the wealth of the country. And you get, okay, into the nations that work more hours than their wealth uh, would um, actually predict. And the worst countries in this measure are uh, the USA okay, and Iceland, surprisingly. So there we go. Okay, um, but, um, but France is among those that has actually fewer working hours uh, than we would uh, actually expect um, but based on the wealth of the country. Even Poland, the average person in Poland is working fewer hours than we would expect uh, actually purely based on the wealth okay, of that country. You will notice that except for the UK itself, except for the UK itself, the other uh, English speaking countries, uh, not including uh, India, but the Western quote unquote English speaking countries, Canada, Australia, uh, also, no, I was going to say New Zealand, but actually New Zealand is doing better than expected also in terms of okay, work hours. And it's Canada, Australia, okay, and also the United States who are not doing as well as their wealth okay, would act actually predict. So there we are, just interesting. So I urge you all to read this particular report. I think it's very nicely presented. Okay, the statistics, okay, are worth uh, reading about and remembering, at least in, in ballpark terms. And it's downloadable. And the link is in uh, the uh, the article, uh, the uh, the Jacobin article, okay, uh, uh, which was written uh, by Megan Day. It also discusses uh, the poor family benefits. Talks about the situation, okay, in other nations. It gives you comparative uh, statistics. So it will open your mind to what suckers we are. It's a good thing to show to Trumpists, I think. Of course, it would probably get them very angry. And they wouldn't believe it. They would think it's a, a socialist hoax and there's no truth um, um, in any of this. But there is, of course. Anyway, the report is very well written and well put, uh, put together. As you can see, a great job by the of the People's um, the Policy Project, and by Ryan Cooper, who writes for the week. 
and occasionally writes in complimentary terms about um, MNT. Uh, though the strongest person there from the MNT point of view is Jeff Spross, as uh, some of you may know. So there we are. The references and notes are there. So you ought to take a look at that. Okay, then we get to uh, the second of the topics tonight, which is some moves that we might contemplate um, but towards a true democratic uh, socialism. And this article also comes from Jacobin, and it was written by Peter Gowan. And it's quite interesting. It's going to take some time to go through. And I don't want it, um, to take all the time on this. Uh, there's an introductory session that um, goes into uh, some green shoots with respect to getting um, to democratic uh, to socialism and some ifs concerning a possible presidency, Bernie Sanders. And the author mentions that one possible outcome of a presidency of Bernie Sanders involves the administration bowing to uh, the opposition, abandoning most of its program, and finding one or two symbolic measures it can pass. Its supporters are told to be happy what they can get. And Peter McGowan says, think of this as the Bill de Blasio scenario, quote unquote. I guess because that's what happened in New York. Anyway, the other scenario involves a working class movement and its president going to war with Congress. Not just the uh, not uh, simply the Republicans, but most of the Democrats as well. Supreme Court and recalcitrant uh, uh, um, state uh, legislatures um, adopting a strategy of dissensus rather than consensus and demanding that undemocratic obstacles to necessary social change are swept out of the way. Think of this as, quote, the Salvador, um, the Salvador, uh, the Salvador Allende um, scenario, quote, unquote. This necessarily means imagining our agenda on a federal level as involving more than just uh, simply parliamentary action and more than one electoral cycle. So, in other words, a fairly long period when we're trying to make a transition um, to democratic um, um, socialism. Peter McGowan talks about having appointments to federal positions and executive action um, 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 to enable uh, labor and social movement assertiveness. He talks about um, using similar methods to Trump, okay, but in reverse to make the federal climate uh, very favorable to, uh, to labor and very favorable to the immigrants, um, undocumented immigrants, taking all possible actions to regularize their status and to dismantle the internal enforcement machine. He recommends that Sanders needs to use uh, the uh, the bully pulpit. It's amazing how sooner or later everybody gets to that expression of the presidency to support primary challenges against obstructionist uh, Democrats. Talks about 
uh, actually getting by the careerists and points out there are many of them who will acquiesce to a leftist programs if it's a choice between that or uh, uh, irrelevance. But the recommendation is that a core of ideological centrists needs to be dislodged entirely if only to set an example for the rest, that they would pay a higher price for obstructing progress than they will for upsetting their former corporate masters. Yes, I completely agree with this. I agree we have to do this. I think that's one reason why the New Deal was so successful. Because it began to dislodge the centrists and began to make them realize Okay, to make the careerists actually realize that if they're going to get anywhere, they had to come to terms with the New Deal, and they had to had to accept the innovations of the New Deal okay, as actually legitimate. This changed politics in the United States for a very long time, until the reaction came during the 1970s with the rise okay, of neoliberalism. Inside Congress, caucuses of committed socialists must be established and will be required to exert their influence to ensure that uh, that legislation is not awarded down. And Peter McGowan points out, Peter Gowan, I should say, points out that we have already seen the beginnings of this with representatives like uh, Rashida Tlaib and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. But, uh, but many more are needed, and existing members of the Progressive Caucus must get more serious about opposing the political establishment rather than acting as intermediaries between the Democratic leadership and the Progressive base. But while breaking down opposition to the minimum program of a Sanders administration, we must also think about how to push forward in the event that we're successful ensuring that we do not simply declare, quote, job done, unquote, upon reaching a social democracy and give capital time to regroup. In a world where we have 12 years to mitigate the impact of climate change, there is no such thing as a partial victory. Very, very important. This means we need to review the legislative component of our path to socialism. How government policy can be shaped to enable changes um, in political economy that reflect and promote class struggle. One of these mechanisms should be legislation that mandates a ratcheting increase in worker ownership and control okay, of major companies. And you know that some of um, on the Bernie Sanders platform okay, is already recommending uh, some policies or advancing some policy ideas for increasing substantially worker ownership and control okay, of major companies. This article says there are a number of models that the U.S. left can look to, the most well-known being the Meidner Plan. That was a 1970s Swedish scheme to use a share levy on profitable companies to build up union-controlled funds that would have eventually controlled all significant firms in the economy. The plan failed due to strong opposition from capitalists, uh, the right-wing parties, and the lukewarm attitude of the social democratic leadership. It was reduced to a shadow of its former self, uh, in its eventual implementation before being dissolved entirely in the early 1990s. However, similar ideas have been revived uh, um, in the United Kingdom, where Shadow Chancellor uh, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but John McDonnell has proposed a system of inclusive uh, ownership funds, uh, IOFs, that would underline labor's um, other economic policies on living wages, uh, democratic ownership, 
um, co-determination, okay, and union rights and public banking. Going beyond this, the party now proposes 1% of company shares be given to workers through um, an inclusive ownership fund each year, up to a cap of 10%. Uh, labor could stand in future elections, of course, on a platform of raising this cap. But they're starting out at 10%. The funds would, in many firms, make the workers the largest single shareholder, and instead of vesting the powers in a distant pension fund they have little control over, they would directly elect their own um, trustees. If we're thinking about how a Senate's administration might introduce a democratic heartbeat, which gradually increases the level of economic democracy around the country on an automatic basis, even if one or more of the institutions of power falls to opponents, a law of this sort could be an incredibly important tool for resetting the default state of economic uh, development away from greater privatization and towards greater socialization. What we are considering here are residual policies which aim to introduce a rising baseline of economic democracy in those parts of the economy not covered by our specific policies that aim to rapidly socialize or to eliminate key sectors or firms. There is certainly, for example, a compelling need to dismantle the health insurance industry by creating a single-payer national health care program. Companies like Aetna and Blue Cross uh, 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 and uh, uh, but, um, but, um, but, um, but, um, uh, but, sorry, Blue Cross and Blue Shield will not be brought under workers' control through a gradual transmission that is mediated through an IOF. They will instead be eliminated entirely with displaced workers uh, um, getting assistance through a transitional program. This is important to note, some potential objections to inclusive um, ownership funds or Meidner-style approaches center around a need for more rapid socialization in specific areas, banking and finance, for example, or the fossil fuel industry. These are not residual sectors. A socialist administration should ideally be socializing finance through controls on capital mobility public banking, and a national investment bank, and bringing fossil fuel companies immediately into public ownership and phasing out their polluting activities by 2030, as proposed by the Green um, New Dealers. There are undoubtedly additional similar sectors, but there are others which should be lower on our list of um, their priorities. What is important, however, is to maintain an ambitious horizon. We do not simply seek to change the boundaries between the public and private sector. As socialists, it is our position that profit extracted by capitalists should not uh, uh, exist. And I'm not entirely sure that I'm um, on board with uh, this last. I am for a vastly increased uh, socialist sector in our uh, um, uh, um, economy. I think there's been far too little uh, involvement uh, uh, um, actually by the government and far too little collective ownership. Uh, okay. I don't know that we should necessarily um, prohibit uh, the extraction of profits by capitalists uh, in all industries okay, and all situations. It may depend on um, empirical analysis and what we find out as we move to greater socialism about what that 
actually does to the prospects okay, for innovation or for change. I do not um, automatically accept that um, to innovate, we need uh, capitalist kinds of um, structures to help us to do that. I don't think that it's the profit motive that actually primarily drives innovators. But I'm not ready to say that we don't need the profit motive. Uh, uh, for everything, there may be some things we do need it for. Also, there's an issue of how much profit, okay, in each instance. Um, in other words, it may be reasonable to allow a very rapid accumulation of profits for a while and then shut it down in each of the industries. In other words, I can see where that kind of thing would give certain people who are motivated by extreme profits um, some reason to create successes that are good, okay, for everybody else. But I don't think that means that they have to profit year after year after year and accumulate wealth and wealth and wealth and more wealth, as we've been seeing, of course, in our particular society, where the accumulation of wealth has gotten obscene and ridiculous and is now a vast uh, 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 danger to democracy and frankly has been in the process of snuffing it out. And we're trying to change that. Anyway, the author goes on and says, with that justification, let's discuss in broad terms how a Sanders plan could operate. And the author is assuming this might be something that would come to a Sanders administration sooner or later. Workers in each firm would elect trustees from among their ranks on an annual basis. If other arrangements, such as a co-determination law, are being um, implemented by the same government, these elections could all could happen at the same time. Okay, an annual uh, economic election day, quote unquote. The inclusive ownership funds, worker trustees would exercise all the rights from IOF shares, including the use of voting rights and any minority uh, shareholder protections and rights to access um, information. <coughs> and then he says okay, that a large proportion okay, of the dividends would be distributed um, equally among workers in each firm while the remainder would be used as a social dividend to promote a collective ownership and control on a wider scale. A classic concern with firm-level worker ownership schemes involves fears about turning workers into petty capitalists. We avoid this by making sure that they retain a strong interest in each dollar in firm revenue being added to a labor share instead of to capital's share. Workers do not, quote, buy in, unquote, to the scheme, nor can they, quote, cash out, unquote, on leaving or retirement. There is an asset lock, quote, unquote, which makes the trust a permanent part of the company owned by the current workers at any moment in time. They receive a dividend, which is limited in size use their shares to influence and control the company. Um, IOS should not be seen as retirement savings or pension funds, though of course workers are free to put their own dividends um, into a retirement account. Well, I'm not going to go through um, all the details here, but this is a very well-written article, and I recommend that you go into it. Um, in detail,
uh, if you use progress k okay, in this particular direction at the firm level rather than at the economic sector level and it says about this that it is also a concession to the reality that in the United States today people feel a considerably greater sense of attachment to a firm than a sector and creating a genuine sense of collective ownership over firms will be considerably more difficult when it involves persuading a Walmart uh, worker that they have a meaningful ownership over Target. And the author offers that um, as an example. And says in order to equalize distribution of socialized wealth between industries and to ensure that non-workers and public sector workers see some of the benefits an increasingly large share of dividends from inclusive ownership funds should be sent to a social wealth fund that would own and manage equity stakes in companies on behalf of the whole of society. The social wealth fund could also receive capitalization from other capital taxes. A range of these are proposed uh, at the People's Policy Project by Matt uh, by, um, um, by, um, okay, I proposed by Matt uh, Brunig. I'm not sure how I feel about um, social wealth funds uh, that are accumulated uh, from uh, from taxes. Uh, I might be for social wealth funds uh, that are accumulated from government grants okay, of revenues where the revenues are created um, directly by the government using the powers of the government um, under Article 1, um, Section 8. Um, of the Constitution. In other words, direct creation of the capital that goes into the social wealth fund. Uh, I would not even be opposed okay, to facilitating the ownership of industries uh, um, actually by workers um, simply by having the government use um, its power to actually buy the firms which it would then bestow upon uh, the workers um, as a grant. Essentially, it would be a grant of assets to the workers in the firm and a grant of ownership okay, in the firm. I'm not sure that's a problem. It's something I would consider and think about in any case. This creates a double mechanism to increase social ownership of the economy. Shares are created in large companies and dilute existing investors while empowering workers within the firm while capital taxes and the returns on these shares capitalize a wealth fund that invests and increases its holding while paying a yield to the federal government that could be used for social uh, expenditure. The federal government uh, uh, um, doesn't need any money to use for social um, spending. It can, of course, um, to simply create um, 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 that money. Neither are capital taxes necessarily needed um, in order to capitalize uh, a wealth fund. Okay? A wealth fund, um, as I indicated above, could be capitalized um, simply with grants with, uh, with grant money created under Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, uh, um, um, created um, simply by legislation 
uh, that mandated that the Federal Reserve simply create uh, the reserves that would be held by the, um, the Social Wealth Fund. No taxes necessary. The fund would also be able to invest uh, 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 strategically in specific firms, combining its own holding with that of the workers to create a public worker partnership uh, with a majority stake. So then Gallen says it is crucially important that large firms be compelled rather than incentivized to share the baseline minimum of shares. However, there is a strong case for providing some financial inducement to those who voluntarily socialize companies at an accelerated rate. This assists the policy by introducing divisions and conflicts into the ranks of capitalists. Any resources that business spends on preventing, quote, strike breaking, unquote, are resources they're not able to use in combating the, uh, the general policy. Okay, so astute observers have previously noted that worker dividends could potentially be canceled out by lower wages. This indeed could be the case in a laissez-faire market, which is why restoring union power and introducing sectoral wage bargaining are so important to the success of this policy. The approach here is a method of moving past social democracy uh, towards uh, the democratic socialism, not a silver bullet that will allow us to skip the work of building up independent working class power um, and a welfare state. It is, in short, a plan for victory. It is likely that a Sanders administration will have no intention of going beyond the laudable social democratic program outlined in 2016. That would be unfortunate, but it would still be worthy of socialist support if the government managed to pass ambitious uh, climate um, um, but, um, but, um, but. Um, that ambitious climate legislation, um, that Medicare for all, expansion of union rights, and stop the slaughter in Yemen, it would be worth our while. But there is another likelihood, a confrontation that the administration does not choose, in which the choices are retreat, uh, but, uh, but, uh, are retreat or rupture. We do not know for a fact that this will happen immediately, but there is a real possibility of a Sanders presidency being constrained by an undemocratic constitution and the autonomous power of capital. As Sanders is elected on a platform of social democratic reforms and chooses to implement those reforms uh, at, uh, at, um, to, and to do it uh, over a socialist uh, but, um, but, um, implement those reforms over a rupture, okay, a socialist rupture, it would be difficult to criticize him for sticking to his platform. But if the choice is retreat, okay, is to retreat or rupture, he must uh, select uh, the, uh, the latter. Unaccountable powers which threaten democracy uh, must be defeated, whether they are empowered by money or by law. It should be the responsibility of socialists inside and outside the administration to prepare policy and the movement for such a situation. We need a coalition to create a new economic system, one based around democratic and ecologically responsible control over the means of um, by, um, by the means of um, um, production, distribution, and exchange. As many of us are confident that a policy informed by labor's inclusive ownership funds and uh, uh, the Meidner Plan, Sweden, has an important place in our toolkit. 
but any who disagree should also be thinking about other agendas for socializing the economy in the event of a successful confrontation with capital. At this point, I'm convinced that there are no better options on the table. A Sanders government should look uh, 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 to McDonald, the shadow chancellor um, in the UK, okay, and to the Meidner plan for a policy to bring uh, economic democracy to America. And that's it for Peter Gowan's article. I thought that, I think, that that's an article that you should be thinking about. I mean, I haven't read too many things that are similar to this lately that contain this kind of thinking concerning the possibilities that a Sanders administration would actually present before us. So I think it's worthwhile thinking about this in some detail and reading uh, the article carefully. It's the kind of imaginative thinking that we should be doing right now. So thanks for listening. Uh, let me go back to see what your thoughts are about this. Uh, why is it still showing me? I don't know. I probably have to change my view here. Yes, I do. Okay, so here we are again. Let me now shift to see what you're saying. Probably take a moment or two for all the levels of this to clear up. But meanwhile, I can check out Going to Gregory. So is Steve Grumbine. Steve D. Grumbine. Russ says no echo tonight. Great. Steve Gonzo says huge news today. Representative Jim Cooper has endorsed uh, the Green New Deal. This is a huge win for Sunrise Nashville and Allies. All the people who kept showing up and have been pushing Jim Cooper to endorse uh, the, uh, the Green uh, by New Deal resolution for the last year. Uh, I saw Jim Cooper uh, I believe it was uh, Susan Eldridge yesterday sent me a link to uh, to a YouTube of uh, hearings that were being uh, conducted uh, on, on in the house by uh, the um, House Budget Committee, and Jim Cooper okay, is a member of the committee, and he was one of those uh, who was present to hear testimony and to question a panel of uh, economists who were uh, trying to re-examine 
of the debt in Congress's uh, um, ideas about how to view the debt, okay, and what to do about it. One economist on the panel uh, was a typical conservative economist who I believe is now working either for a Washington think tank um, or for CBO or perhaps for CBO. I have to check exactly where he comes from. Again, he used to be um, used to be a professor at Stanford. Uh, and he's very conventional economist, thoroughly steeped in CBO's work, in its models, and its long-term uh, forecasts. So he was the conservative voice, okay, on the panel. Then there was uh, Olivier Blanchard, who uh, used to be, I guess, the chief economist at, uh, was it the IMF? Uh, who had, over the last uh, um, a few years, been coming around to a position much more friendly to um, MMT views. And so he was on the panel. Jared Bernstein, uh, was on the panel. He also has been getting closer to MMT over a period of time, uh, and who was friends with uh, Stephanie. Uh, and who appears at Economics for Peace and Security conferences. And the fourth member of the panel was, uh, was Randy Ray. And so Jim Cooper and the others uh, were questioning the four of them. Uh, okay, and the proceedings are very interesting to see. I spent a lot of time today, okay, watching them. And uh, okay, it was very interesting to hear how difficult it was to frankly express and fit the MMT views into the pattern of questions, okay, and answers. It looked as though Randy was feeling under terrible constraints in terms of what he could say and what he should probably not say. He was, for most of it, really quite um, subdued. Of course, the way the verbal testimony works out is they get in okay, a panel okay, of experts and then there's partisan questioning of the panel okay, of experts. And the Congress people try to keep um, control. So they ask you a question, okay, and you have a very short time to answer the question, in part because each of the Congress people has a very limited amount of time themselves to do the questioning. In this case, they had only five minutes okay, to do questioning. And, uh, the hearing period still took close to three hours okay, to complete. But each congressperson gets uh, five minutes, and that includes the answers to questions that are posed by the congresspeople. So they expect the witnesses, the expert witnesses in this case, such as Randy, to respond to questions in a very brief way. And I think it's something of an art, something of an art, 
to be able to dialogue with Congress people um, 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 in this particular setting okay, and to anticipate what they're getting at uh, with a particular question and how best to respond to tie them um, um, in knots because their questions are designed to lead you into saying certain things that they can use to make you and the position you represent uh, actually look bad. So, for example, at one point, uh, there was a string of questions that a conservative congressman was asking, okay, of Randy Ray, you know, trying to put uh, the MMT in a bad light because the MMT advocate there, okay, was Randy, okay, and basically uh, um, 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 asking Randy whether he knew about uh, the situation in certain nations, and he asked them questions about certain of the Latin American nations which had been experiencing inflation that was um, um, severe um, um, inflation. Okay, and I, I didn't think that Randy used uh, his replies real well. Like, for example, he was asked whether uh, he knew Peru. So I don't think he knows too much about Peru. So of course he didn't want to say, okay, that he did. So he, uh, you know, he said no. Uh, but he left it at that. And then the congressman moved on to another example. Okay, another example. Okay, another example. Um, 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 including Venezuela and Chile. Uh, and Randy didn't really study any of these um, in detail, but I know Randy knows um, Argentina. Um, um, I know that he was involved in the MMT project um, down there uh, when they were uh, advising uh, the uh, the Kirshner administration uh, 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 on the job guarantee, and there was a a job guarantee program okay, that was implemented um, um, down there for a while, and that did very well from a technical standpoint, but not so well from a political standpoint. Uh, but anyway, okay, I'm pretty sure that Randy is probably still up on what is going on in. Argentina because he got close to it okay at that point so he might have actually replied and said uh, yeah but I know the Argentinian situation uh, pretty well would you like to ask me about that <laughs> and so maybe uh, he would have been able to drift you know, the congressman um, over to that and taking him off uh, his game. But anyway, uh, what I'm trying to say is it's an art to reply to Congress people in such a way uh, that you direct them to some points that you would like to make rather than being a puppet of theirs in answering questions they pose. You have to say the right uh, things, I think. So, anyway, I digress. Teresa Sanders says, I got to shut up and eat your peas talk today, and I realized that's exactly what all of my economically secure friends had been telling me. The light bulb moment. Who'd you get to shut up and eat your peas talk from today, Teresa?
Okay, so... Thanks for all the comments today, by the way. There are an awful lot of comments. Okay, I've got them now. Steve says, cue the banjos. And Lana says, we're so busy for the last few months that I don't know what to do first at this point. Overtime is nice. But boy, am I tired. Cheyenne says, uh, uh, F the Zook, but not literally, of course, only figuratively, right? <laughs> Steve Wolfbrand said, Biden said in debate that solution to domestic violence is to keep on uh, 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 punching. Ah. Uh, Steve says, a mind is terrible to lose. <laughs> uh, the Evelina Pont says, the utopic four-day week has become a flexible work week, which means less money and no health benefits. Yeah, I noticed. Evelina says, essentially a nightmare. Teresa says, uh, you mean weeks? But said... Um, four hours, FYI. Steve says late stage capitalism. Um, Evelina says duped. Uh, we were. Steve says exactly Yoda. Steve says Epstein didn't kill himself. Teresa says that joke won't um, either. Susan Eldridge has joined and said we need a four day work week and less work hours overall. And higher wages, too, per hour. Steve says, Prince Andrew does nothing for a living, but he does it in private now. <laughs> Susan says, actually, I'm ready to retire. Evelina says, and full benefits. Steve says, me too. And Steve says, can somebody check on the doctor? People bring their work home now, and cell phones are a constant intrusion. I know. In Spain, the work week is shorter because there isn't enough work to go around. Okay, Evelina cries a little bit, gives the crying sign. Margot Shepard has joined. Russ says, very interesting point. Steve says, I was in Portugal and Spain recently. They seem very happy. And Evelina says, in Spain, people work less hours because there isn't enough work. They have to get by on part-time work. Steve says happiness should be as important as GDP. Evelina says not happy about working conditions. Steve says, have you been there? And she says, not recently, but I have friends there. Steve says, um, Evelina, it's a different lifestyle. Evelina says, I know that, but surely you're not implying people everywhere don't need to make a living wage. And she points out, okay, Madrid and Barcelona are expensive. Surely, you're not suggesting people everywhere don't deserve to make a living wage. Big cities are quite expensive. Uh, fence, etc. Rents. <laughs> Steve um, says, um, Evelyn, I'm in L.A., Homeless everywhere. Rent is half your income. People are angrily, angry and depressed. It's dystopian. Okay. And my daughter, Devora is there okay, as well. And uh, she is currently looking for, um, 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 for a new apartment. So... Russ has got a call it a night. Interesting info discussed. Uh, thank you, Russ, uh, for coming and for helping out. And hopefully I'll see you on Saturday. Bonnie joined. Dale Weaver joined. Steve says, got to go too. Good night. Dolores says, joined. Jeffrey has joined. And Teresa says, thanks, Doc. And Lana says, 
Randy did a great job in five minutes, including the sectoral balance chart and uh, a discussion. I don't know. I don't think the sectoral balance chart actually went over, Lana. From what I saw okay, of, the, of the discussion later, it went right by them. I didn't think he emphasized um, heavily enough. I know he didn't emphasize heavily enough what it means to people to have the government be running surpluses and the private sector therefore getting drained of uh, reserves. I didn't think he drew the connection sufficiently well between that kind of austerity and likely austerity for regular people. Uh, he really needed to make that point then and there. That when you run surpluses, although deficits um, for four multiple years, and specifically deficits, that uh, do not compensate uh, for the current account deficits, okay, or the trade deficits, that you drain reserves from the private sector, make the private sector poorer. And generally, it works in such a way that the poorer people are in the private sector, the more they suffer from the reserve drains. I think he needed to make that point, and he didn't do it at that point. And he didn't do it later either. Anyway, Devore has joined. And Steve Devore has joined. I think Randy made a number of good points, okay, throughout the discussion. But I don't think he dominated the discussion. And we needed to have him dominate the discussion. I felt he was too tentative and not sufficiently aggressive in answering the questions. Just my opinion. It's not a question of knowledge because a very large percentage of what I know about uh, MMT, I know from reading Randy closely, and Warren closely, of course, and Bill closely, and Stephanie and Scott, Pavlina. I've read them all closely. I don't know anything that Randy doesn't know when it comes to the economics. But I still don't think that he did a good job in replying to the conservatives. It should have been easy for him to demolish them. For example, okay, at one point, he was talking about, okay, and answering the question of, um, uh, he said, okay, one, we've only paid off on the national debt at one point. That was, okay, in 1835. Okay, and two years later, we had one of the worst, okay, of our depressions, or words to that effect. Uh, you know, the panic and depression okay, of 1837. Okay. It was a perfect place for him to extend it further and to say further, and every time we have drastically reduced the national debt with surpluses, 
our actions have been followed by depressions um, or recessions. Before we had a social safety net, those efforts were followed by depressions. But since we've had a social safety net, uh, things uh, have been somewhat better because social safety net has provided a floor a beyond which the economy could not fall. Which, by the way, suggests we need more social safety net, not less social safety net. And he should have said that emphatically and strongly. Because these conservatives, of course, didn't know what they were talking about. Any of us could have made short work of them in an equal discussion where we had equal rights to the floor. Of course, he didn't have that. They were the Congress people. He had to speak in a respectful way. But I've seen people come before them and speak in a respectful way and still um, artfully say the things they had to say. Not always to our benefit. Um, but, um, but for example, people from, uh, what's it called, the sister organization to the Peterson Foundation uh, that's headed uh, by, uh, by Maya McGinnis of the Committee for uh, It's, it's, it's the CPFB or something like that. I forget, uh, you know, what uh, the initials actually are. But she's been heading up this group, okay, for years. She comes to Congress every year, and they ask her questions, and she twists it the way she wants to twist it. She's very expert at that. Okay, I agree, Lana. I think he felt restrained. I don't know who asked him to testify. I looked at the people who might have asked him to testify um, on the committee. And there are three people on the committee who might have asked him to testify. Uh, Ro Khanna is on the Budget Committee, and Pramila Jayapal is on the Budget Committee, okay, and Ilhan Omar is on the Budget Committee. The less likely members include uh, Jim Cooper, who we just were talking about. Uh, yeah, she's uh, part of uh, Fix the Debt, but there's a more important uh, um, organization. Uh, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, I think it's called, the C. Uh, the CRBP or something like that. I don't know. Okay, I look it up. It's all over my books on the Peterson Foundation. It just is uh, slipping my mind uh, right now. Uh, okay, maybe Jim Cooper. I suspect somebody on the committee went to Stephanie and asked her to testify. And she couldn't do it because I think she's on a trip to Australia right now. Or something like that. Or getting ready to go there to um, Australia. Uh, so they probably asked her, well, um, who else could come and testify, uh, you know, on behalf of MMT. So she probably went to Randy at that point. Okay. And so Randy then was asked, okay, in that way. But who the motivating people were on the committee, I don't know. But those are some of the possibilities. 
Uh, but also Lloyd Doggett okay, is on the committee, and he may have been getting clued into MMT over a period of time. He's sometimes thought by certain people to be the smartest person in Congress, in terms of, you know, native intelligence. Anyway. I'm sorry, London. What's London? London? What's London? Fix the debt? Uh, London? <laughs> oh, Australia's in January. She's in London now. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Yes, I guess January is a good time to go to Australia, right? <laughs> Maybe one of the best times to go to Australia, except it may be awfully, awfully hot and dry in Australia uh, this January, right? Steph is in London, okay. She is globetrotting. Anyway, I'm theorizing. I don't know any of this at all. I'm speculating as to how it came about uh, that, uh, that Randy uh, was the one who was testifying before the committee. Okay, now Randy has had previous experience in testifying before Congress. So, okay. I think uh, he's been there a few times, so he has some experience. And Lana says, very expensive plane ticket. Yeah, I expect Stephanie isn't paying for it, though, right? They must be paying her expenses for that. I think they still have money over there okay, in the UK to pay for those things. Don't know whether our universities are as well fixed. Any other comments or questions or gossip to be exchanged? <laughs> okay. So, I hope you enjoyed this a little excursion into dreamland, okay, for today. I thought it might be a nice um, change of pace. On Saturday, I'll get back to some of the troubles we are having right now. Um, in the meantime, please share, like, and subscribe. Uh, the, uh, the YouTube video when it goes up in a few minutes. And please become a patron at www.patreon.com from slash Joe underscore Firestone. And thank you for any help that you are able to provide. And thank you for any further comments you have. If you have any, I'll give you a minute to register them. Okay, so I've been experimenting with some new backgrounds. So, 
Um, how's this one look? may take uh, just a moment to show up on your screen. If anybody is still here to view the new background. <laughs> okay, hang out for a second to see the new background, which should appear. There's a little bit of a delay here. There it is. How do you like that? Thank you for coming, Evelina, and good night to you. Well, you should have it by now, I think. There's a the little, little bit of a delay. There we go. <laughs> it does weird things. I don't think it's quite ready for prime time. Yet. They have an application, it's a camera application that I use. It intervenes between the camera and the image that actually gets uh, shown. But uh, you should have been seeing it for a while now. But there's something of a delay. Anyway, any. Any other comments or questions? I'm sorry, Bonnie. So the background is showing fine now, isn't it? Kind of a little weird though, right? <laughs> a little spooky. Okay, I'll change back. I'll change back to the original background. Oop, got the wrong thing. I guess that one still looks better. Okay, so I think on that note, I'm going to end things for tonight. Have a very nice night. I'll see you on Saturday around 9 o'clock to 9.10, somewhere in that time frame. And everybody have a really good time until then.